everyone and welcome back into our journey to the blue sky i am patricia and my name is aaron and today we're going to be talking about the 2011 blue sky studios animated film rio yeah and uh, i have to say right off the bat um very surprising i have to say because uh, i mean i hadn't seen rio at all until then and uh, it's uh, i mean when, when did rio come out like you know 2000 and uh 11. 11, yeah, so uh, it's a movie that's kind of passed me by for like the last, oh, about like the last uh, um, 12 years, I guess you could say, and um, so I finally watched it, and uh, I mean, I wasn't blown away from it, but uh, I have to say it uh, was very, was surprisingly good from uh, mm -hmm. what it had to make. So, um, the story goes that uh, we have a bird called Blue, who uh, was uh, living as a, as a baby, happy in the jungle. Everyone was singing and dancing until some poachers turned up, uh, kidnapped him, and uh, took him all the way to Minnesota. Uh, and then uh, he was uh, then rescued off the back of a truck from a, a girl from uh, Linda, who owns who grew up with uh, Blue her, his entire life, the last 15 years, and uh, she now owns a bookstore. In, uh, in 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 the in the um, in the city, uh, she then uh, gets meet. She meets up with a um, a uh, wildlife um, expert who uh, wants to then uh, pair up Blue with a, another a bird because uh, these two birds are actually the last of their kind. And uh, in order to save the species, uh, basically they need to uh, uh, get them both together in order basically to make the next generation of uh, these uh, these particular birds. And uh, but uh, in the middle of all of that, they both get kidnapped uh, by a gang of thieves who uh, is basically run by a uh, by a cockatoo who's known by the name of Nigel. And uh, then um, it's up to them to escape, and uh, they basically all the shenanigans ensue, uh, pretty much uh, from there. So um, yeah, so I mean, like it's uh, first of all, I think it's a, a great story of uh, taking uh, a character out of his elements. You know, he is uh, basically a uh, you know blue is basically a domesticated animal by every stretch of the imagination to the point where he cannot fly. And yeah. uh, I think, you know, this is great storytelling, I think, in this regard. Taking someone out of their element and uh, putting them into a whole new environment. Like, you know, things like that. You know, you know I've, I've said many times in other podcasts, like, why does this movie exist? You know, for like, you know, these TV movies. Like, you know, putting up the stakes, putting up the odds. Like, uh, why would you take a movie and basically just do exactly the same thing that you would do in, a t in the TV series of said movie? And so, this is these type of examples that I would say to people, look, and, you know, they Rio is not based on a TV series, at least as of yet, you know, in regards to this, at least as of this podcast. And so, uh, Rio is an original movie, but um, the the point I'm trying to make is, is that this is a reason why you create a movie and put in high stakes. You're taking uh, Blue, and you're taking him out of Minnesota, where, you know, that would basically be his... Um, status quo basically for the last 15 years of his life you then throw him all the way to rio de janeiro in brazil and uh, then you basically have this basically high stakes adventure that you would have with various other colorful characters and so i mean this is the when i say why do, does a movie justify its existence it's basically this this movie this movie is a great example of that yeah. Now, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, but this is very similar to the Sony film Open Season, in which it's about a bear who was raised domestically, and then all of a sudden, there's a poacher involved, and who wants to hunt bears, and now he's wandering around in the wild, where he meets up with a, a bunch of colorful characters, and he eventually gets himself used to the wild, but at first, he's not used to it because he's been domesticated all his life. I get it. You know, it's a very similar concept, but the execution of it is different. First of all, Boog does not meet up with a love interest. No, he does not. He's just basically trying to find his way out of the forest so that he can be able to meet up with his owner who's raised him all his life. And, you know, here's the thing that the owner was a park ranger. 
Rio's owner is a bookstore owner, and she is very out of her element just as much as um, Blue is. So it actually works well with not only with Rio's side, but also with his owner's side, in which they're both out of their element. They're still getting accustomed to um, the city of Brazil, where it's going through this major event called the Carnival. And also, they both, in a way, found love. And it's in a way that they've never expected. Yeah. I mean, uh, in regards to open season, I mean, like, uh, I wouldn't even compare it to Rio. I mean, like, for me, open season is kind of like a, a weaker version of the Fox and the Hound. And, uh, you know, that's uh, that's saying a lot, really. But, uh, I mean, uh, um, yeah, I really didn't see much of open season, I think, in Rio. At least in my opinion, anyway. I think think somewhat similar, but not, not, not really. really. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, I would say that the existence of Rio at least in my opinion, is that uh, this is about, uh, you know, um, many things. It's about love, it's about uh, survival, it's about adventure, it's about, you know, he's even got social commentary in this as well. Like, uh, one of our side characters in this is, is a, 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 a Brazilian orphan and, uh, you know, there's plenty of them pretty much, you know, uh, oh, yeah. uh, exactly like that. And, uh, you know, the, one of the things I really like about Rio is that, uh, you know, uh, some people say that, you know, uh, um, yeah, but you know, uh, taking one idea and uh, doing it again is plagiarism, and you know, taking a bunch of ideas and basically putting them all together is research. And uh, you can really see definitely that uh, Rio has definitely done its research. There's like elements of like Aladdin in this movie, and uh, like uh, there's elements of like all the other like you know uh, you know where uh, I would say there's some, like some Pixar elements and some DreamWorks elements, and like they Speaking really the Pixar, do. Well, I guess that, that's the one thing that we need to address here. So for all of you hardcore Pixar fans, you probably know that around the same time that Rio was. Produced, Pixar was going to be producing a similar concept to a film called Newt. So Newt was about two Newts who met up together in a university, and they were the last of their kind, and they had to procreate to save the species. But due to the fact that Rio came out a few months before that they were going to be working on the film, it was delayed and then eventually got canceled. Yeah, but the point I was making is is that uh, they, um, you can definitely feel like there's some Pixar, you know, influences here, there's some DreamWorks influences here, and, uh, you know, they really do tie them up very, very well, I think, in all of this. And also, on top of that, like, you know, um, Rio de Janeiro in this movie actually feels very epic when you look at it. Like, you know, they do, like, you know, lots of sky views, they do, like, a lot of, like, views on the ground where you feel like, you know, just immersed in, like, the world and the culture and things like that, like, and also, like... Uh, they also hit some, like, you know, um, okay, I would uh, argue, like, some of the more ter touristy, like, you know, parts of uh, Rio de Janeiro, but at the same time, like, I mean, let's, uh, I'll say, say this, I think they probably uh, hit uh, Rio de Janeiro a lot better than, the, you know, Ratatouille definitely did, <laughs> you know, if, uh, if we have to, <laughs> to compare it to anything in Rio de Janeiro in regards to movies, but... Uh, I mean, like, uh, so, um, I think, um, they really did tie a lot of good elements together, and, uh, um, so, I think, uh, you know, in regards to the presentation, in regards to, uh, you know, um, I mean, obviously it has, like, uh, the one thing I would say that it definitely does has have, like, here's that kind of, like, Disney thing as well, like, you know, the villain gets a song number in all of this, you know, Nigel gets to, like, you know, talk about how, like, you know, he was, uh, uh you know, famous at one point, and, like, he was a, uh, you know, a, a bird who, like, you know, was, uh, you know, um, was, uh, uh, you know, uh, admired in a TV by, show. In a TV show, things like that, was admired by like all of Brazil and things like that, and then it all fell apart when a, parakeet, a younger parakeet came in, uh, things like that. So I mean, like uh, you know, easy come, easy go in regards to showbiz, and uh, he took it very, you know, pretty much the wrong way. It kind of reminded me like, uh, oh, who is that villain in Batman the Animated Series who um, was like a girl who had like her own TV show and oh, baby uh, doll, baby doll. Yeah, there's a little bit of element of that. Do you think? Do you think there's, uh, you know, I don't think it's not exactly like baby doll but you can feel like there's a little elements of that where you know he basically you know, loses all his fame and then goes psycho basically so. yeah for sure i mean it there's a lot of firsts here in blue sky i mean it's the first like real location now we've had ice age and we've had robots and we've had horton hears a who in which you couldn't exactly say oh it takes place in this location but no rio is actually a very distinct location in which it takes place in rio de janeiro and you get to see all the sides of it both the touristy side and the ugly underbelly of it in which it's filled with crime 
and you know you have Fernando who's an orphan and he's trying to make ends meet by stealing things for poachers so yeah I mean it, it's kind of like a complaint that we had from um, Abominable if you remember the DreamWorks film that came out a few years ago in which you felt that Shanghai their partic- their depiction of it was a little bit too organized and clean yeah, well, I mean, like, it was for a Chinese audience, wasn't it? So, of course it was going to yeah. be. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I think uh, with, well, in regards to, like, you know, the gritty side, I think, of uh, of Rio de Janeiro, I mean, obviously they play that because, obviously, the villain, you know, villains obviously come from that side of things. And also, also our, uh, you know, our orphan, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, character in this uh, in this uh, episode, you know, sorry, in this episode, <laughs> in, the, in this movie, uh, also, you know, uh, comes, comes from there. So, uh, you know, there were some elements of, like, Aladdin in there a little bit as well, like, in regards to where you know all of that like you know you've got like you know this uh a uh, whole like you know uh, awful side of like you know it's got like Agrabah you know like you got this whole like you know awful side of it and then like when you zoom out like you know you see like the whole view of like you know the uh, the more you know glittery side of Rio de Janeiro in this and so uh, yeah so um, um, actually I just realized like you know maybe we should probably go through some of the characters a little bit so uh, Jesse Eisenberg basically go plays Blue in this and Anne Hathaway plays Jewel who is the uh, female uh, Macaw in this and so she's basically the uh, the you know she, 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 like you know they try and bring bring bigger up as like you know the love interest of this but so you know she's not interested in uh, you know this whole idea of like you know saving the species she's interested in her own freedom and basically being yeah. free and like in the world and everything. She has no idea about the whole saving the species thing at all. The only thing that she cares about is being free because she's a wild macaw who was captured by this um, this organization that wants to save the birds, um, specifically the macaws. And, you know, they help them by treating their ailments and they help them by helping them recover from poachers. So... You have this situation in which when, um, you know, she's being held in this private sanctuary with just herself and she's not with the other birds because she could be very feisty. She was attacking the other ornithologists, um, including one that we see a little bit earlier in the film in which Tulio was introducing um, Linda over to their sanctuary. So, yeah, we basically see that Jewel does not care about, like, Blue whatsoever. All she cares about is being free and going back home to the forest. Yeah, and it even gets even worse when she gets chained to Blue. Like, she basically, you know, ends up being... Mind you, one thing I will say about this movie is that it does, like, the whole, like, you know, cliche, like, you know, oh, I'm chained to the person, I, you know, the odd couple chained person, you know, chained to this person, and now I've got to find my way out of it, and then finally when I get, like, you know, freed from this person, all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm actually really like this guy. You know, it's, yeah. like, it's like, it's, it's that cliche, you know, like, you we're know, not... it's that cliche. And I know the whole Disney joke about like, oh, they were able to fall in love in a day or three days or whatever. Yeah, it's pretty true. But I mean, for the most part, because of them being chained up together and all the stuff that they had to go through, especially since, you know, she had to be the one to help Blue out because Blue can't fly. But at the same time, Blue knows how to climb very well in tall trees and in buildings and stuff like that. So even she was pretty pretty impressed with it so we do get this interesting balance between where blue is known for the urbanization point of brazil while jewel is known for the forest side and we do get a mixture of both especially with the carnival that's happening mm-hmm. also uh, we kind of like get um i would say our you know um do, you know our, our, du- our comedic duo in there so will i am basically plays pedro who is a red crested cardinal in this and jamie fox uh, uh, of uh, you know django and chainflame plays nico who is uh, you know a yellow canary and uh, Obviously, like, you know, uh, they basically have, like, you know, their uh, R&B, like, you know, song numbers and things like that. And uh, so, Which is interesting uh, because I know that in the movie they were, like, saying about samba. But, yeah, their flavor is more R&B, especially with Will I Am, which makes a lot of sense considering that Will I Am is a member of the Black Eyed Peas, which is a R&B band. Mm-hmm. So I think that one of the things that I really was impressed with this movie, once again, and this is something that we've been saying throughout this entire retrospective, the animation is super colorful and detailed. I think that's the strongest thing that we've seen throughout this entire uh, series of films that we've been watching, is that 
Yes, the characters are a bit cliched. Yes, the stories may be a little bit generic or maybe they're just downright awful, but the animation has been stellar. I would say that they're right up there with Pixar and DreamWorks for their 3D animation. Yeah, well, let's continue talking about the characters just for a second because, uh, I mean, like, uh, we have, um, we have uh, you know, our two humans in this, which uh, basically are all, all Linguini you know, and Col Col Colette in this, uh, in this movie, I guess you could say. So we have um, Linda, who is basically, you know, uh, the the other half of Blue, pretty much in their team. You know, she's brought her, basically she's kind of like her, kind of like her mom, basically. You know, like uh, she's brought uh, Blue up. You know, uh, to, you know for the last fifteen years, but uh, you know she always has like you know a uh, very deep and close you know uh, relationship with Blue in in, in that, uh, which I think is uh, obviously is uh, you know it's cartoon world, so you know just go with it. As far as I would say, well, I mean it makes a lot of that. sense considering that she actually found. Um, Blue when she was a little girl and she had raised him all throughout her childhood and when she graduated from college and now they're living together working at a bookstore unlike in open season once again um, you know she's only had um, Boog for like the first few years of his life because uh, you know bears don't tend to age as um, long compared to birds I mean birds can live for a very long time depending on the conditions and also again she's a park ranger and she's accustomed to all this but yeah we saw in like the flashbacks and in the pictures that um linda was able to do everything with blue she had her birthday party with blue she went to the prom with him she went to graduation with him they did everything together so it's not too much of a surprise when she was very hesitant when tulio offered to take blue to brazil to have an opportunity to mate with the other female macaw to try to save the species. And then Linda was like, no, I refuse to do this because Blue needs a lot of caring and we've always been together. They even have their own little um, handshake together. They even have um, their own little ways of showcasing of how they're able to communicate with one another. They understand each other. Yeah, so but, but that's what I'm saying. Like, that, that, yeah, that, that doesn't necessarily happen in real life, though, with a bird. I mean, like, uh, that, that's what I'm trying to get at. So like you know, well, I mean, uh, sure. I mean, I'm sure for a bird that's true, but I'm sure that people feel that way with other pets like dogs or cats or something like that. Well, yeah, but um, what I'm saying is, is that you know, uh, you're not gonna have a secret handshake with your bird. Basically. No, no, no. Of, yeah, of that's, what, that's what I'm saying. But so, um, in regards to you know all our other characters, like so, um, you know, you got uh, Linda, and then you've also got uh, uh, Tulio, who uh, ends up you know basically being you know I guess uh, Linda and Tulio end up being our other you know uh, couple in this in this movie. So uh, they. Uh, you know, inadvertently also tried to basically get, you know, the, the, these two together. And, uh, you know, uh, one thing that uh, I think, imagine, this is the one thing in in the movie which uh, I don't think we've actually seen Pixar or DreamWorks or even Sony or any other uh, studio I know that has actually done this. They actually, like, fanserviced Linda to Tulio. I don't know if you yes. know, it's like when when they did that, when they they were the um, the McCaw costume on her, and it's like I was just kind of like, um, like uh, who's this movie for again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I always say that the thing about this film is that it has a lot of tonal shifts. It's like, in the, like literally in the beginning of the movie, where you see these birds like really happy and they're singing akin to like Happy Feet, in which you have like the singing penguins, and then all of a sudden, boom! You have smugglers and poachers stealing them, and then Blue just falls down, and then he is captured in a cage by these poachers, and then put in a truck. It's like the reverse Bambi, in which like we learned that Bambi's mom died, and then all of a sudden. We cut into uh, springtime and the birds and all the animals in the forest are singing. And it's like, wow, what a major tonal shift. Yeah. It's just, it's, um, it just felt kind of weird. Like, you know, who is this or I mean, who is Rio aimed at here? Like, he seems to be kind of like, you know, trying to poke it at like every particular audience you could potentially get at. Like, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who like, you know, really like dark stuff, people like you really, you know, comedic, you know, uh, uh, stuff, people like you like Disney songs, people who kind of like, you know, uh, you know, comedic duos, you know, uh, people who like to draw, draw, you know, Rule 34, you know, art and things like that. Like, you know, it's like, oh uh, there's, yeah, I know. It's like, it just seems to be, seems to be like this uh, movie seems to be like, you know, uh, bouncing over, like, you know, to different, like, genres, different, you know, uh, audience you know, members, you know, like, uh, uh, different other people. Like, it just, it's, uh, you can tell that Rio definitely was like, uh, you know, trying to like get as many people involved in, uh, as humanly possible in this movie. Maybe in maybe inadvertently and inadvertently, maybe I would say. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and, and I think that the way that they were able to mesh it well, I mean, there's some moments in which it works, and then there's some moments in which it doesn't. Yeah. So, I mean, in the ways that it doesn't work, I mean, I have to say that, I mean, here's the thing about Rio, like, um, I would say that I, I do like Rio, but I wouldn't say it's my favorite movie by any stretch no. of the imagination. Like, uh, I think, you know, um, I, I wouldn't put it over Madagascar. By any stretch of mind, and that, that's quite a thing to say, you know, given the fact that we, you know, rated, we didn't even rate Madagascar all that well in our uh, in our. In our it was okay. Discussion. It did have its highlights, but I mean, you have to admit that there was a lot of things that Madagascar had that Rio didn't. Yeah. First of all, it had four characters to follow. A second thing is that. Um, it was able to have a lot more going on other than just them being stranded in Madagascar. We had Alex who wanted to eat his companions because he was starving and he was used to eating a lot of meat. And then there's also the thing about them trying to get back home. And then we have a subplot with the penguin. So there was a lot more going on in Madagascar. Well, as in Rio, we have... Okay, we have the instance where we have the two macaws who are trying to save the species. Now they're chained up together, and now they have to get back to their respected owners and locations, and the smugglers are trying to find them. And then you have a side plot with the humans, and yeah, it's not really that much, to be quite honest. Yeah, I mean, compared to, like, Madagascar, where you know, even you have the penguins as well. You know, in, in, in all of that as well. Like, you know, for better for worse, whether you like the penguins in Madagascar or not. But uh, at least they're in the movie and they have their own, like, little adventure currently going on. Well, yeah, everything else and, is happening as well, well, too. Well, Rio only had one sequel, which we'll talk about uh, in a few weeks. Um, Madagascar had three sequels and an animated series and a spin-off series, so they had a lot more to work with. Yeah, but, I mean, I guess Rio's going to be, like, one of those big, you know, what could have been. And mind you, like, uh, I mean, uh, as of this podcast, I mean, there is rumors going around that Disney is interested in doing another Rio movie at some point. Yeah, so. and if it, if it turns out the same way that Adventures of Buck Wild did, then we are in for a disaster. Well, we haven't talked about Buck yet, and we haven't even seen Buck yet either, so uh, we, yeah, don't, we, we don't I mean, know we're going to count that as a bonus episode, considering that Buck Wild was under the Disney marker, not under the Blue Sky marker, so we will not be including it in our full list of Blue Sky projects, although we will give an honorable discussion to Scrat Tales, which I know is a mini-series that only aired for like a few few episodes so we'll talk about that as well yeah anyway going back to uh, rio so um fernando is our you know um orphan child in this and uh, who we basically is you know bashed around by the bad guy and uh, you know is uh, you know um obviously is uh, you know just along for the ride not because uh, he you know is evil or anything like that it's because he's got nobody else to kind of like rely on for basically for support and these are the yeah. only people that he can basically rely on for, like, you know, getting cash, you know, and uh, he's basically kind of being used as a tool, basically, by our uh, our antagonists. So, I mean, there's a lot to sympathize with in that character. And uh, and so, um, but, uh, I mean, also, he's got, like, a lot of street smart. The one thing I'll say about Fernando is that I don't think they gave him much to, I mean, they gave him, like, some sympathy moments, and uh, they gave him, like, um, you know, uh, you know the uh, the whole, like, you know, I would say Charlie Bucket kind of, like, you know, uh, you know, treatment. I guess you could say for uh, you know in uh, Char you know from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but uh, you know I don't think uh, I I think he could, he could add a bit more story maybe. And actually, there's another thing as well. Actually, I would say about Rio is that not just with Fernando, but you know I feel like you know the uh, if they want to make his care a bit more about the uh, the Linda Tulio kind of like pairing, and they should have given them a bit more time. And uh, if they wanted just to kind of care about more about some of the other characters, maybe they should have gave them a little bit more time. And I get you know um, there's only so much to, you know. Uh, you know, time you can play with. I probably imagine there's probably a lot of, uh, you know, scenes they would have loved to have got to, but they have to be cut for time. But, uh, so, I mean, this movie is 96 minutes at the end of the day, so I guess, you know, they had to, you know, the the the, the, the cutting, the, the night, the scissors had to basically cut somewhere. But, uh, I don't know, like, I think that's one thing that I think that kind of holds us by caring, you know, too, too much about, you know, the side characters, that I feel like they've not given them enough, kind of, like, time to kind of, like, you know, explain themselves all that much, really. And, yeah, uh, like, I mean, what happened to Fernando's family? Why is he an orphan? Were his parents killed? Were his parents um, died in an accident? Was he always an orphan? Who knows? 
um, why did he decide to um, help out Linda and Tulio other than that one scene in which when he went to talk to the poachers and he was saying, oh, I want to be able to help you out more. And they just refused. I mean, he could have probably found other ways to make ends meet or maybe that was uh, the only way. But again, we don't really know. Well, let about me just it. caveat this discussion with this. And that is that uh, everybody who's like saying like, you know, any of the discussions that we're having right now is like, uh, well, in the sequel, this happens. We haven't seen Rio 2 yet. Yet. So just hold your horses before you start making those comments. <laughs> so like, you know, exactly. we're, we're doing this in order. This isn't Pix Mix, okay? No, so. this is not Pix Mix. So we are doing this in the proper order. And yeah, I admit that Linda and Tulio should have gotten a lot more development because, again, going for the whole they fell in love for a day thing. It was pretty quick. And you try to justify on, I know that they spend a lot of time together, but it was mostly for the fact that the smugglers came in, broke into the sanctuary, stole the the macaws, and now they're trying to look for it. And, you know, with Linda just constantly being worried about where Blue is, it's like, where did she get enough time to actually speak to Tulio to get to know him more and all that kind of stuff? I mean, I can justify with Blue and Jewel because they had a lot of time to spend together. They were literally chained up. And also, they met up with other characters along the way. There was even an opportunity for them to have kind of like a love moment in which they were in the train and they were going to meet up with um, Louise, the uh, the bulldog who was going to help them with removing the chains that were attached to them. And you have Nico and Pedro giving this whole kiss the girl moment in which they were trying to sing a romantic song and trying to have Blue confess to Jewel that he loved her even though he's screwing it up. I mean, you have um, the... Um, the uh, the what was it um you have the um other bird who's played by george lopez rafael that's what his name was oh, so yeah. rafael is trying to help him say you know tell her how you feel tell her that you love her tell her that you're that her eyes are beautiful so he's trying to coax her and to giving blue the opportunity to see that oh no it's the other way her. around blue is the one he's giving the lens to blue and blue's the one that's messing yeah, that's up the right, jewel. Right, yeah exactly right. so i mean but here's the thing you can't blame blue for you know messing this up because obviously like he's so domesticated like to the point where he can't even fly and that's the one thing about actually messaging in this day like he's a mccall that can't fly in this and yeah. so like uh, you know his whole existence is basically you know walking around and uh, you know he's uh, had this whole you know flying thing haunting him basically since he was a baby so of course he's gonna basically have that in his character which I think they actually did very good uh, foreshadowing I think at the very beginning of the movie to to, to nail that in but uh, so I mean you can't blame Blue for being you know inept in being able to like you know coax a female into you know meeting, meeting with him because obviously like he's never had this experience of being in the wild so it's uh it's uh, one of the... I mean, this is another thing as well, like, uh, I mean, um, this is in the... Rio is in the collection of movies of, like, here's a character who is so... Dem it's like, it's in the same bracket as Madagascar, in a way. It's in the same bracket as Flushed Away. It's in the same bracket as, like, here's a character who basically has lived in a house this entire time and has never, like, lived in its own wild environment. And therefore, yeah, exactly. Like, it, that, again, yeah. it's in the same realms as even Doctor Doolittle Two, in which it's a very similar situation where you have this bear who was a circus performer all his life and raised in captivity, and you know his kind, uh, his breed of bear is the last one, and they're trying to breed him with another bear who's wild, and he's this you know cool talking circus bear who knows how to perform tricks. He knows absolutely nothing about being in the wild, and so Doctor Doolittle tries to say, hey, if we can be able to leave him in the wild for a few days, and if it works out, then then that's great. It'll justify the reason of not cutting down this forest and having the animals being leaving towards somewhere else, or maybe, like, completely stranded. So, yeah, I mean, this plot has been done before. Yeah. I guess also you could say maybe, like, it has some elements of, like, uh, you know, where if you really want to include this, you know, Onward, like, uh, you know, the Pixar movie, like, uh, so it's like, it's a bunch of fantasy characters who, like, have never been, like, fantasy characters for a while because the conveniences of modern technology have basically taken over their lives so like they've kind of like forgotten like the characters like that they're supposed to be 
in a way. So yeah, and, I guess there's some elements of that, I guess you could say. The second half, of, at least you can say the second half of Wally could be an example about like, okay, you have these humans who have been in this spaceship for 700 years. They've never been able to walk around. They've just been floating around and they've never been able to um, understand the concept of what human life was before the events. I mean, they've just been comfortable and content with their lives. I mean, even the captain didn't even know what a plant was. He had the robot basically do everything for them. Yeah, I guess maybe some people listening to this might think we're being a bit unfair because, you know, Onward came out in 2020, uh, as we know. That came out before the pandemic, you know, before uh, everything like that. And, you know, where Wally was 2000... Actually, well, actually, no, actually, no, that's, you know, that's a fair no, complaint, Wally, actually, for Wally. Wally, Wally was 2008, yeah, actually, thinking about it. Was, it so. so it came out uh, four years before. Before Rio. Yeah. yeah. So I guess one thing, I think, just saying that is that, uh, unfortunately, maybe one of the reasons we didn't enjoy it that much is because Rio really isn't kind of like covering any new ground. It's kind of like uh, because we've been through so many DreamWorks films, because we've been through so many Pixar films, and heck, even we've been like, you know, through the occasional film that's, you know, not done by Pixar and, uh, you know, uh, DreamWorks, and uh, we've been, uh, you know, doing something in search of the Crystal Skull. Like, these types of movies that Rio, I mean, would have, like, been... Um, you know, uh, would have done. I mean, we've sort of kind of seen before, really. So, like, yeah, uh, it's, and, and yeah. like we said, just because that something has been done before doesn't mean it's automatically going to be good. We talked about this in Robots, in which even though that that movie came out in two thousand five and it came out before Lego Movie, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, Meet the Robinsons, and Zootopia, those four movies were able to do it way better of a concept than Robots is. So, yes, even the reverse can be justified in saying, yeah, just because something came out first doesn't mean it makes it better. Yeah. Um, so, I guess we're not talking about our villains yet in this movie, because, I mean, like, uh, um, the only, here's the thing about this, like, the human villains are so generic, like, you know, uh, you can't really remember them all that well. The only villain I remember in this is Nigel, because of this is how, how insane he was, really, yeah. like, and, uh, and he, he's, he's like the best villain in the movie, unfortunately, because at least he was smarter than the humans. I mean, you have the two lackeys who are just dumb, and then you have the lead guy who's just caring about money and wanting to sell all these birds for money, and it's like, great, what else is new? There's nothing else other than just them being the bad guy. They have no motivation other than making money. At least with Nigel, I mean, he he actually has a backstory. It's a short backstory, and the only way that was able to be explained was via song. But at least we knew it. Yeah, it was like it was like you know the you know the big lift alligator moment. That's you know when nostalgia trick kind of like you know coined in that regard. Like you know it was kind of it was kind of like that really. Like he just came out of nowhere and he was just kind of like, okay, I'm going to explain how evil I am now. Goodbye. You know, like it was there just you go. yeah, there you go, yeah. Like uh, it would have been, it really needed like an, more of an introduction, really. But it just kind of like came out of nowhere, really, and just kind of cut took us all by surprise. This is the thing about like you Nigel, know, like he's so like in your face and so upfront, and like he's just so like you know obnoxious and that. Like you know, you do end up like he's not like one of the, he's not a fun villain to be around, effectively. And like maybe that's not what they were going for with Nigel, but like I mean, if you're gonna do this type of movie and uh, you're gonna have like this kind of like this uh, fun somber bounce and things like that. At least you want the villain to be fun, at least. Heck, even the, the villain out of, you know, the Princess and the Frog, even though he was quite intimidating, he was still kind of fun to, like, you know, sing around, you know, like, you know, uh, are you ready? And everything like that, you know. It's just, it's, uh, so, um, I think, I think that's another problem, I think, that, that Rio has. Like, the way I would have written Nigel, and I don't know if you'd agree with me about this, Patricia, is that, uh, the way that I would do it is that I wouldn't have Nigel as, f uh, as upfront as, like, you know, a villain. I would have him, like, kind of, like, you know, uh, Marcel as, like, the main guy who, like, you know, he's calling the shots and everything like that. And then it's later revealed that, you know, Nigel is so intimidating as a villain that even Marcel is afraid of his own, you know, bird and everything like that and basically he's the one who's basically running the show he's the one who's like you know uh, creating that and basically throw the audience like uh, kind of the same way like Wallace and Gromit kind of like, throws you as like you know who's the, uh, the 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 by the way spoilers by the way if you're not watched you know uh, uh, Curse of the Were-Rabbit kind of like throwing you like you know who the Were-Rabbit actually is in, in in that. Like, you know, you think that the you know the main person who's driving all this is Marcel, but in actual fact that you would be like, oh no, later on in the movie I should find out he's Nigel, and even he's more after you had that reveal, like he's even more intimidating than he was when to begin with. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think that would have been a way better way to write Nigel in my opinion. But mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean and also other things that were included in this other than just a a distinct location was that this is the first musical in a, in a Blue Sky film because all the other ones didn't. So uh, and and here's the a music... problem. Can you actually remember any of the music numbers from Rio? 
No. No. And, and here's the thing. Real and Rio, which is the song that kind of like introduces the movie, was nominated for an Oscar, but it lost to Man or Muppet from the Muppets. And I remember that song even like 10 years after that movie came out. Yeah, exactly. Like, Well, mind you, the, the Muppets movie basically brought back the Muppets. I mean, let's, let's be honest about that. I think... Uh, that, yeah, you know, sure. Yeah. But still, it's like... I mean, if you're going to have a musical, like if you're going to bring a musical, especially with the likes of other Disney films at the time where it was able to showcase, hey, we're going to have like bombastic music, then go all out. I mean, this came out about around the same time or even a year before Tangled. Yeah, Tangled came out and then a year or two later, Frozen would come out and pretty much just cemented that, hey, musicals and animated films are making a comeback. So this could have been it but unfortunately it was not i don't remember a single song other than the song from nigel but even then that's because of the visuals and just how insane it was it kind of reminded me like you know you remember the pebble and the penguin you know, don't make me laugh it's kind of like you just uh it kind of it kind of yeah, like those exactly bits, it? Yeah. from pebble and the penguin yeah yeah it's just it was um it, I, I, it was it, it, nigel needed to be a fun villain in this movie and he wasn't like he was just intimidating it was kind of like you know you can just wait for him just to kind of like be off the screen and then you can just concentrate on all the, all the other characters this is another Thing. Nigel was like an annoyingly villainish, I would say. Like he's just like, okay, you know, just do your thing, and then you know, do your shit, and just get lost. You know, like uh, it was kind of like that kind of thing. Like uh, you know, we're just waiting for him to kind of like just, you know, just go away, and then we can just focus on you know other things. And uh, oh, by the way, um, the one thing I didn't like about um, the fact as well, like you know, uh, spoilers by the way, if you haven't watched Rio, mind you, like you probably have watched it by now. But uh, you know, they actually did. You know, you, you, he at one point he actually ends up getting thrown out of the plane, and he ends up like going through uh, the propeller of the plane. You think at that point he died. At that point, yeah. you think that was the end of it, and I thought they were gonna like do, you know, when then they shown him like you know still alive. I thought, oh god, they're doing a Masters of the Universe on us. When you when they show like you know the guy who plays Skeletor in that he comes yes. up on the scene and says, "I'll be back," and like I thought, oh, <laughs> oh, are we gonna see him again? In Re Imagine we're not. By the way, we've not again. We've not seen Rio two at the minute, so we don't know if we're gonna see Nigel again or not. I'm not too sure. But, uh, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of reminded me of that, really. It's giving me, like, you know, that yeah, massive... Yeah, and also, cringe. like, the, um, you know, the, um, the, uh, the post-credits of the live-action Sonic the Hedgehog movie, in which we see Dr. Robotnik, when he finally comes out from the Mushroom World, it's like, I'll be back, Sonic. I got what I needed. And he has one of Sonic's quills. Yeah. Well, I mean, I liked that more than any... Well, definitely even the more than, the, you know, the villain reveal, you know, saying he's back alive, you know, Rio and the one from Masters universe i'd take you know jim carrey over that because at least it means that you know oh, hey we're going to see jim carrey again in song of the hedgehog 2 you know yeah like, so and, uh, yeah that makes me happy be, not 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 not, not exactly. infuriated that'll make me a very happy person to see jim carrey again but i mean you didn't have to bring nigel back for the sequel it could have been some other th major si situation that would have happened like maybe well another... again we're not seeing the sequel yet so we don't know you yeah, so. know, I know, but still, it's like um, uh, we'll we'll let you know about how we feel about the sequel and whether Nigel was justifiably, um, you know, needed to return. So we'll just see. Okay, well, um, I've not, I've not, again, I've not seen Rio too. So like, you know, don't, I actually don't want to be spoiled on that. Actually, so uh, yeah, <laughs> tell me, yeah. Don't, don't tell me anymore, please. But um, so um, the way the movie ends is that uh, you know, um, uh, I don't like the way that you know Linda just lets go of Blue. I would have thought they would have been a more like you know they would have said some things to each other. I thought, and I don't, I get that you know they're not supposed to like understand. I mean, they do understand each other and stuff, but uh, I don't know. Like uh, I thought there would have been like a bit more of a complex you know conversation between Blue and Linda because they've been through like fifteen years of like a relationship together, pretty much. Like you know, and uh, but in the in the end, he kind of just like you know, oh, we do one last you know, uh, you know, handshake, and then after that, he he flies off, you know. Like, yeah, just... unfortunately, that wasn't the case, and I guess the reason why is because that Blue and Jewel are living in the sanctuary where Linda and Tulio are working at. So I guess they could see each other more often. Again, we haven't seen Rio 2, so we don't know if they actually will meet up with one another, but at least they're in close distance. So I guess maybe that'll be a possibility. But yeah, there should have been like a goodbye or maybe there should have been like um, a speech where Linda says, Re, uh, you know, Blue, we've been together for 15 years, but I see that you have another um life that is ahead of you you met somebody i'm really proud of you and you know go out there my big blue brave boy or something like that but 
No. She decides that she's going to basically stay in the sanctuary with Tulio as her boyfriend and actually, from the looks of it, possibly adopt Fernando? Like, where did all this come from? I mean, again, we don't know, like, the time jump of what happened. It could have been months later, maybe a one year later, because uh, we saw in the end credits that Blue and Jewel have chicks now. So... Yeah, we, we don't know what the time jump was between then. Uh, Who knows? Well, I mean, um, I was looking to do a bit more research on this movie and I accidentally stumbled upon, um, you know, uh, one of the, um, uh, you know, the fan wikis that they do. And, uh, I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, they have a name down right now is uh, uh, Linda uh, Mon Ontario. So I'm guessing that she did marry uh, uh, Tulio uh, in, in the okay. end. And uh, then I'm guessing that, you know, Fernando now is their adoptive, uh, adop adopted, you know, son. I'm guessing. Okay. So, uh, but you know, like, uh, um, I'd go with it. I mean, like, uh, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, uh, if that's going to be the case that we're going to, you know, I guess we're going to see them again, I guess, in the second movie, but uh, I'm not too sure. But, yeah, uh, I'm not yeah. too sure either. I mean, if that was going to be the case where we were going to see the last uh, scene in the movie in which she does end up staying in Rio with Tulio and Fernando opening up a bird sanctuary, it's like... Man, that me that would definitely justifies having more time with the two characters because maybe she would have gone through a similar situation. I mean, first of all, she lives in Minnesota. It gets really cold over there. So maybe she's like saying, oh, it's really hot. Or maybe that the fact that she's in a small town and in a city like, um, you know, Moose, um, Moose County, um, no, 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 not Moose County, um, Moose Lake, Moose Lake, Minnesota. Maybe she could have said like, you know, I'm not used to this. It's too loud. It's too noisy. It's too hot. But no, she never goes through that. So there could have been an interesting balance between um, Linda getting used to Rio de Janeiro and Blue getting used to Rio de Janeiro and, you know, her interacting with Tulio and Blue interacting with Jewel and, yeah, we don't exactly get that. I mean, it's like you were saying that maybe they cut it for time, but yeah, that I wish that they would have justified more screen time with both um, Tulio and with Linda. Yeah, I think, uh, um, well, who knows? Like, uh, maybe it might be the fact that, uh, I mean, this is, that's a good question because, you know, in the whole, um, you know, carnival scene, like, you know, she's basically put it like, like in the middle of the of, of the carnival, pretty much. And, uh, you know, she's been told to like, you know, uh, you know shake a button and things. It's kind of like, you know, we don't do that in Minnesota. Like, you know, it's just, it's... Uh, yeah, so, it's because yeah. it's a completely different culture. Exactly. So it's... Uh yeah, it's just it's um, uh, it's kind of, it kind of feels like it is kind of like forced a little bit in some places, I think. And uh, so, uh, I mean, again, like you know, you, you don't expect you know, I guess in movies like this to like you know do these like a hundred you know hundred percent right. But uh, at the same time, like you know, if uh, if you're going to be competing with Pixar and you're going to be competing with DreamWorks and you're going to be competing like you know with other ones, like you know, you you have to get the story at least somewhat believable in these things. So, and uh, also the characters are believable, I guess you could say too. Oh. Yeah, but again, hopefully the sequel will be able to give us some more clarity. Yeah. Okay. But overall, I think that this movie was actually pretty good. There are some things about it that were a little bit weak, but overall, I think that the package was pretty decent. I mean, it's definitely a lot better than Dawn of the Dinosaurs, that's for sure. Oh, definitely. Uh, sure. Like, and, uh, I mean, is this the point where now we jump into another Ice Age Ski sequel? Or are yes, we <laughs> yeah, it is. So, uh, is, oh the, 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 Rio was our break from Ice Age for a while, and then we're going to go straight back into it again. So, uh, yep. But, so, yeah. yeah, I know. It's like. I told you this was going to be, you know, every other movie we're going to be talking about an Ice Age movie, and I'm, I'm already getting sick of it. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm going to ask you now, don't you? Uh, yep, I know. We... Tune in next time, everybody, as we're going to be talking about. Ice Age Continental Drift. Well, I was going to ask you, are we going to be scoring this movie? Oh, <laughs> that too. Okay. Yeah. Right, okay, so, um, I mean, again, like, it is surprising how good it is, and uh, it is t it does have some familiarity in regards to, like, all the other stuff that we've seen before, but the one thing I think that holds it back is originality, and uh, I think that, you know, you're going to find yourself when you're going through this, like, uh, you know, I, I was say pointing out to uh, Patricia, you know, throughout the movie, like, you know, this whole, uh, you know, scene with Fernando kind of reminds me of something out of Aladdin. This thing kind of reminds me out of, a, you know, a most thing I saw out of Onward. This kind of thing kind of reminds me out of something I saw out of Wall-E. 
This kid thing kind of reminds me out of something I saw out of robots. You know, like, uh, you know, we were just pointing things out along the way that, uh, you know, we've already seen in, you know, in other, you know, animated movies. And so, I mean, like, uh, it, but here's the thing about this. Even though it doesn't really, like, do anything too, you know, massively original, it doesn't really get too much of anything's wrong either. Like, you know, uh, the music, even though it's not all that memorable, I think, you know, for Brazil is on par. Rio de Janeiro looks fantastic in this movie, by the way. It looks so epic when you look, we're looking up and down at it, and when you feel like you're on the ground. You know, there's other, the, the Carnival scenes are actually really good as well, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, and it just gives, uh, seems to give something for everybody, I think, in this movie, and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, no character, I believe, feels all that much out of place. I mean, um, the, uh, I feel like, you know, the, the, some of the characters need a bit more development, I think need a bit more story, and, uh, I mean, the villains could be a little less stock and could have, like, you know, had, they could have done something a bit more unique with a villain, in my opinion, including with Nigel as well, making him probably less, a little less intimidating to the point where you feel like, you know, you do want to see him on screen again because you feel like you're going to get something out of him, but uh, entertaining out of him anyway. He just kind of feels like just he's just kind of like a bad guy, pretty much that, and maybe probably too generic for my liking. So, with all that being said, I think I have to give it a solid 7. I was going to say the same thing, 7. Cool. All right, yeah, so you already know what next time is. So in the meanwhile, hope that you guys enjoyed our discussion of Rio, and we will see you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye.